Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is Leadership Lessons from the Great Books Podcast, episode number nine. With my guest today, well, there is no guest today. Instead, we're going to address leadership from a little bit of a different perspective. When one studies nonviolence, peace building, forgiveness, and reconciliation, a person, a studier, an academic, begins to realize that there are intersections with darker human habits. The same methods by which we create environments of war, violence, stress, conflict, and trauma tend to mirror the methods by which we create the opposite. Often it is the people in a culture who are in the space of being out of authority and with little conventional power who have to figure this dynamic out. And then they have to decide what to do with it. During this month in the United States of America, there is typically a lot of digital ink spilled and video and visual and political rhetoric thrown around about the accomplishments of America's original discriminated against minority. And it's not the displaced natives that we're talking about either. The man who figured out that there was power and the ability to move a majority society in the direction of more rather than less justice was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Many years later, his name would rise to the heights of secular worship, even as the God he prayed to and the Jesus he spoke about was banished ignobly from the American public square. He would be embarrassed and ashamed, I think, if he could see that. And many people in the racially roiled present age that we all inhabit seek to use, they seek to leverage his decontextualized words and ideas in order to make their political positions more secure and to personally benefit by grifting and hustling the very majorities they rail against. All the while, further damaging and cynically tearing at the social fabric of a country whose promise they never really believed in in the first place. Shame on them. Leaders read the great leaders of the past, regardless of the majority or minority status that they may have had, and they seek to learn from those leaders and then to ruthlessly apply the lessons to their own followers' conflicts, problems, issues, and concerns, regardless of the color of the skin the human being that they are reading may have had. So we're going to take the opportunity to do some reading here today. We're going to take the opportunity to do some examination, and I'm going to inject my own thoughts So let us read and have ears to hear, and eyes to see, and a brain to comprehend. From the Atlantic Monthly, August 1963, The Negro is Your Brother, Volume 212, Number 2, pages 78 to 88, what would be known later as Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And I quote, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities, quote unquote, unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms across my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the argument of quote-unquote outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. 
Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So I am here, along with several members of my staff, because we were invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried there, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Saints, secular and religious, turn out to have feet of clay when they and their actions are inevitably judged by the long course of history. And it is well worth remembering, after the FBI files and the endless rumors, some more salacious than others, that he was just a man. At the end of it all, he was just a man. We celebrate his birthday in January partially to not overshadow the month that will follow. However, in doing this, we forget that he would have, in all likelihood, wanted you to work. Work, after all, lay at the foundation of the last years of his life, and work defined him from birth to death. This is what leaders do, by the way. They say yes to the work that others may have been offered in the past and said no to performing. And they say yes, in spite of what that cost will bear. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. Negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in, Bingham, in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of them, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political fathers consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Leaders will sometimes say to our coaches in sessions after training, I've done all that I can do, or I've tried everything with this person and they just won't change. This is typically not the truth. Usually leaders, when they say that, are looking for us to provide them with an external justification for something that they've already decided to do. At a minimum, it is an admission of impotency that borders on the incredulous. Leaders haven't done everything until they've done the things that make them the most uncomfortable. In dealing with any reality that needs to be changed, whether it's the reality of an individual or a nation state, whether at work or in the nation state, there have to be four basic steps achieved. Clarity about the problem, candor about all the options needed to negotiate the problem, the courage to be uncomfortable with the long and arduous process of changing a circumstance that may be weighed down by both history and inertia, and then, of course, the desire to go forth with a solution. The bigger the weight, the more courage will be required of a leader to face the inertia, their own impotency, and to cast off their own ignorance of solutions to problems that might lay outside their comfort zone. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. 
On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstration. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. As the weeks unfolded and the months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remain. As in so many experiences of the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternatives except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as means of laying our case before the conscience of a local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved, so we decided to go through the process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asking ourselves the question, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? When a leader has the courage to begin to ask their followers how heavy a weight they are willing to carry, he or she has now entered the arena where reality, inertia, and the gravity of ineluctable fate begin to swirl together. Such conditions create either a star that shines brightly or a black hole that sucks in everything and warps reality. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. You may well ask why direct action, why sit-ins, marches, and so forth. Is it negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Um, Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront an issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue so it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths, the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So, the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so that Christ, so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in monologue rather than dialogue. Another question we ask participants in our training, one of many is this one, in relation to conflict and negotiation mostly, but it works pretty well in other contexts, is do you believe you think clearly? The shocking answer is that 9 out of 10 people in the room will not raise their hand in the affirmative. Many will sit in the room failing to think clearly even about the question about clear thinking. And many of those people in that room are in positions of authority, positions of control, power, status, eh, positions of position. Failure to think clearly inevitably leads to anxiety, ennui, panic, and depression. But clear thinking, as Martin Luther King has just demonstrated, usually confirmed through clear writing, as Martin Luther King Jr. just wrote, is the type of thinking leaders are called to engage in if they really want their realities to change. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern, since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in public schools. It is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws, 
there are just laws and there are unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that, quote, an unjust law is no law at all, unquote. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine when a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. To use the words of Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, segregation substitutes an I-it relationship for the I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. So segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, uh, but it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Isn't segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, an expression of his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? So, I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court because it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances because they are morally wrong. Let us turn to a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. This is a difference made legal. On the other hand, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is unwilling and that it is willing, sorry, to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. An unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority which that minority had no part in enacting or creating because it did not have the unhampered right to vote. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up the segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conniving methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties without a single Negro registered to vote, despite the fact that the Negroes constitute a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? A word on sin, which is the point of all of this. When you don't do what you're supposed to do, and you know you're supposed to do it, you quote-unquote miss the mark. In the Greek language, upon which the New Testament was built for the benefit of Greek-speaking Gentiles at the time, you have committed hamartia. The Reformed systematic theologian R.C. Sproul, many, many years later, remarked that, quote, sin is any lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God. This may be a matter of act, of thought, or of inner disposition or state. The theological term for the study of sin is hamartiology, from the Greek hamartia for sin, error, or missing the mark. The Apostle Paul used the verb hamartano when he wrote, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Leaders are challenged in their organizations to confront the hamartia surrounding them, leveraging all the tools available at their disposal. Does this mean that they are on a never-ending quest for moral purity at work, in their teams, or in their cultures? Well, maybe or maybe not. But performing in a lukewarm or mediocre manner in the face of obvious hamartia can only lead to the dragon of hamartia growing larger and larger until it finally eats you. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. 
who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a quote-unquote more convenient season, unquote. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I received a letter this morning from a white brother in Texas which said, quote, All Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but is it possible that you are in too great of a religious hurry? It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. Unquote. All that is said here grows out of the tragic misconception of time. It is the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. I am coming to feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. This podcast is not focused on theology in and of itself, but we are not ignorant to the impact of religious belief systems and their power over leaders. All religious systems, even the secular atheist cynic, believes in something, even if she is religious about herself. All religious systems are inevitable in the human experience because we cannot create our own values out of our own selves particularly when those values we have created run up against the cold, hard facts of the reality of other people's experiences and other people's belief systems. Christianity, a truly radical religion whose founders made radical claims about the man and his beliefs that lie at the core of the tradition, requires its followers to take its precepts deadly seriously all the way down to the precepts that exist from Jesus Christ's mouth about justice, morality, and the teachings on justice. Jesus' presence and existence confounds the believer and the unbeliever alike, but for different reasons. It behooves leaders to know the words that Jesus said, particularly as those words have influenced the direction, tone, and shading of Western thought for the last two millennia. You cannot have justice without Jesus. But you can have plenty of injustice without Jesus. Back to a letter from a Birmingham jail. You spoke of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first, I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of an extremist. I started thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is a force of complacency made up of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodiness that they have adjusted to segregation. And on the other hand, a few Negroes in the middle class who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and because at points they profit by segregation, have unconsciously become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred and comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up all over the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. This movement is nourished by the contemporary frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination. It is made with people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incurable devil. I have tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need not follow the do-nothingism of the complacent or the hatred and despair of the black nationalist. There is a more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. 
I'm grateful to God that through the Negro church, the dimensions of nonviolence entered our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, I am convinced that by now many streets of the South would be flowing with floods of blood. And I'm further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble rousers and outside agitators, those of us who are working through the channels of nonviolent direct action and refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes out of frustration and despair will seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologues and ideologies, a development that will inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. Nonviolence means nonviolence, all the way to the logical, rhetorical, even physical end. The church, the Christian church, is fundamentally nonviolent. Anything outside the church may become hostage to ideology, slave to men's passions, or justified by rational scientific methodology to serve an end. Advocating violence as a leader doesn't make you lead better. Violence is the last act, not the first, and should be tread it into dangerously rather than gleefully, or even worse, ideologically. Lastly, from a letter from Birmingham Jail by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. Uh, This is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call Zeitgeist, and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, he is moving with a sense of cosmic urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Recognizing this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. So let him march sometime. Let him have his prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If his repressed emotions do not come out in these nonviolent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat. It is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. But I have tried to say that this is normal. And healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Now this approach is being dismissed as extremist. I must admit that I was initially disappointed in being so categorized. But as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a mockery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate, or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? As we turn the corner, remember that leaders have to make decisions and have to commit with consistency to their proscriptions and prescriptions. When we have made a decision and follow through on it as leaders, we have done so with clarity, candor, and courage, and not done it quickly. Well, then we become forces for justice, not by creating new things, but instead by demanding that present institutions live up to their own established standard Finally, the end here from a letter from a Birmingham jail. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. 
If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet young people every day whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are presently misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson scratched across the pages of history, the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence we were here. For more than two centuries, our foreparents labored here without wages. They made cotton king, and they built the homes of their masters in the midst of brutal injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, our people continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we, are now, we now face sh will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. If I have said anything in this letter that is an understatement of the truth and is indicative of an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything in this letter that is an overstatement of the truth and is indicative of my having a patience that makes me patient with anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. And that was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speaking to us across the distances of history and appealing to our Christian roots in an Augustinian manner and saying yes to a call to engage in a struggle that has already very much been won. And not in the ways that he thought. The words he used to describe the United States' original sin and then the years following, the dealing with that at a cosmic level echo through to today in the efforts of every tin pot ideologically enslaved leader of a movement in the remainder of the 20th and the opening of the 21st century. And yet, though he had feet of clay, as all leaders do, his followers could mimic the language and sense the energy, but they missed the core of the argument. Christian belief, thoughts, and appeal to righteousness has influenced opposition to oppression in the modern world from the efforts of William Wilberforce to the writing of this letter. The first lesson for leaders here is clear. The enemies of your position clearly will seek to destroy you, but so will the zealots on the other side and within your own camp who claim to be your allies. The second lesson for a leader is as follows. Be prepared to adopt a cosmological view of changing people, systems, and institutions. For when you are seeking to lead people into the process of bending the iron law of institutions, you have to know that it may take a while to heat that iron up. The third and final lesson for leaders is that they should prepare themselves to give everything, emotionally, psychologically, financially, and even physically, to the change they want to see in the world. It is never, and it will never, be enough to show up, say slogans, intimidate enemies, and then turn around, pack up, and go home. And uh, being the change you want to see is more than just a cool meme quote. And to think, you just learned all of that about leadership directly from jail. And that's it for me. Follow us on all the places that you follow us. Please subscribe to Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. Please tell your friends. Please like and share. Please also check out the HSCT website for all products and solutions. Please check out the Leading Keys website for products and solutions, our remote training services, our books, our trainings that will help you become a better leader.
And watch this space for more information about our upcoming book, 12 Rules for Leaders, a guide to intentional, a foundational guide to intentional leadership coming in April 2022. Please also go to HaysonSorrells.com for more blogs and more posts about how you can be a better leader and check out all of our YouTube channels online. Thanks and have a great rest of your leadership day. Out.